Good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Michaud, and it's time to go flush in the pocket. Presented by Brunswick Bowling, sponsored by Just In Time Recreation in Lewiston. And uh, while we are waiting on our guests, we're going to talk about Just In Time Recreation. Great bowling center and uh, entertainment facility. They are on uh, 24 Mollison Way in Lewiston. And... You can reach them at 207-786-2695, justintimebowl.com. They got birthday parties. They got a whole bunch of bowling. They got good food, good beverage, great people. I think the people are better than the accommodations uh, because the people are awesome. I mean, the accommodations are amazing, but the people like Justin and Samantha who own the place, they're awesome, okay? They are just absolutely awesome. So uh, anyway, hopefully everybody is having a nice evening. And yeah, it's kind of late because our guest, actually, we'll get into our guest in just a moment. If you're looking for bowling on TV, look no further than the, uh, is it the strike derby? Yeah, that's tomorrow on FS1. And I'm not exactly sure what time it's on, but I know that it's on. So uh, definitely uh, check out uh, that tomorrow on FS1. The reason this podcast is not at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night or 8 o'clock on any night tonight, that is, is because our guest is none other than 22-time PBA champion, PBA Hall of Famer, who at one point while he was retired, right, oh, the Strike Derby is on Fox. Okay, it's on Big Fox. It's on Stewie Griffin Fox. Awesome. Uh, So when Marshall Holman, at one point while he was retired, he was still seventh in the money list. Um, And yeah, so that was, and he, whenever Phil Ferguson would mention it, he would say, yeah, I'm dropping, uh, like a retired rock. Uh, So there you go. And of course, Marshall won his last title in 1996 at the Ebonite Classic. What a great uh, tournament that was. He was the tournament leader. So we are waiting for him. And uh, let's see what's going on here. So um, the uh, PBA tour season has come, or the uh, schedule is on its way out. One of the highlights, though, is they are kicking off the season on Monday, January 15, with the PBA Players Championship. And uh, so I don't, it's not the finals. It's uh, it's like match play or something like that. So it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Bowling on TV begins in 2024 with the Players Championship. And what I'm going to do coming up, once the schedule comes out, I'm going to come on probably by myself because the guy that I wanted to have on, I mean, he said he'd do it, but I don't want to bug anybody. I'm going to come on probably by myself, go through each of the telecasts, give you who my top five might be, and, of course, pick a winner. So uh, we're going to be doing that. And uh, like I said, just waiting on the guest and see what's going on here. So. Um, yeah, let's check out while we're here, let's check out PBA.com. We're going to keep an eye January 15, 2024 is when the uh, bowling begins on Fox and it's going to be awesome. PBA on Fox. You gotta love it. You know what I mean? Like you really do. So let's take a look at some of the things happening at uh, on PBA.com. While we are uh, able to, let's congratulate Some guy you may not have ever heard of, but I mean, a couple of you might have. Um, Pete Weber 
is your 2023 PBA 50 player of the year. And I mean, he is a great bowler, still doing it on the PBA 50, 50 tour. I am sure he's also bowling on the PBA 60 tour. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Um, but anyway, in any event, he is still kicking butt on the lanes like he should. And uh, yeah, so let's see what's going on. See if I can get Marshall here. He told me to message him. And uh, I did about five hours ago. And yeah, so let's see. But so coming up uh, in a day, two days, uh, let's say, on Flush in the Pocket Monday, we got Tom Smallwood. I'm going to be working on that episode tomorrow. And then next Monday, we've got Wes Malott. I got to finish that episode up. And yeah, it's going to be awesome. It really will. And yeah, so lots of big things happening in the world of Flush in the Pocket. If you want to tune in, and I think you should, let me get over to Bowling with the Feff because he's got a guest on Tuesday that you don't want to miss. Let's see what's going on with Mr. Bowling with the Feff. All right. So we got my post, but we also have the... He's going to have a chat with Al Houston on Tuesday, and that is happening at 8 p.m., Eastern time. So, and let's see, that is going to be on YouTube. So go like bowling with the Fef on YouTube. And there's also a Facebook group. So another thing too, if you want to be on bowling with the Fef, email Andrew Pfeffer at bowling with the Fef at yahoo.com. And you can also, you can also join his Facebook group Bowling with the Fef. Now, his sponsor is Chip Magnet Salsa. Chip Magnet Salsa is not located in Maine, uh, probably located in uh, Oregon, uh, but it's definitely located in Wisconsin, where Andrew is from. And right now, if you make an order of $30 or more, you get a discount, all you have to do is use promo code BWTF, I believe 23 is on there as well, and then you can enjoy a discount and, of course, raise your snack standards. So I'm not sure what's going on here, but uh, did send the message to our guest. And let's see what is uh, what is happening here. Uh -huh. Now, I want to thank, while I can, I want to thank <clears throat> Sarah Marcotte for joining me on Monday. And uh, she was great. Of course, you got to see her 18-month-old beautiful daughter, Sophie. And, of course, you got to meet her uh, partner, Ed, who is... Uh, a great guy and of course they also bowl in lewiston they also bowl in portland uh so they are a great bunch of people she's a lefty he's a righty and of course she thinks that he is going to be if she or her daughter i should say is going to be a two a uh, left-hander so we will see about that uh, so hang on just one second here i appreciate everybody uh let's see let me see if i Told me to text him, and uh, there we go. And I, <laughs> Marshall says, uh, told me to text him, and he says he's getting, he's old. He, I said, no, Marshall. I said, relax, you're not old, you're only 45. So I do apologize for the delay, and I do uh, appreciate you standing by. We are uh, waiting on Marshall Holman, and it is, of course, a little past seven o'clock in Medford, Oregon. And Let's 
Let's do a little. Uh, let's do a little uh, biography on Mister Holman. Hang on one second. Let's uh, see if he's if he has um, heard or no. But we're gonna go here, and we're gonna check out how great of a guy or great of a bowler he is. So let's do this. Let's go to Google and Marshall Holman stats. Take a look at that. Here you go. Marshall Holman is from the city of Medford, Oregon. Now, Medford, Oregon is a place. Oh, let me see here. Hold on. Uh, Medford, Oregon has a lake and it is Crater Lake and you cannot swim there. And uh, it looks really nice. They showed it. I want to say in the 04 Medford Open, uh, one of them, I believe it was 04, uh, one of the early ones. I believe they've only showed it a couple of times, but Crater Lake is, of course, in Medford, Oregon. You cannot swim in Crater Lake. And let's see. So let's, oh, what's, what's going on here? Um, so let's blow this up so I can read this. So Marshall Holman won uh, won all but one of his 22 titles of the Professional Bowlers Association between 1975 and 1988. All right, so we know that because in 1996, that's when he won his uh, 22nd title. And he won the Tournament of Champions in 1976 and 1986. Also won the U.S. Open in 1981 and 1985. Uh, so what am I doing here? Okay. So he also, uh, was on tour for 23 years. He won the George Young high average award in 1982 and 1984, as well as 1987 when he was player of the year. So <clears throat> Now, here's here's a funny thing about Marshall being player of the year in 1987. Marshall won two titles, or excuse me, he won no titles in 1987. Pete Weber, on the other hand, won two titles. And, I, I mean, you know, back in the 80s, it was hard to say how many was kind of a staple for you to win. How many titles do you need to win in 1980? Uh, in the 1980s to win player of the year. Um, it's really hard to say. It's hard to say any time, I guess. But <clears throat> in 1987, Pete Weber had two. Marshall had none, but he, you know, he just did enough that the players voted him player of the year in 1987. So that, of course, is awesome. And uh, still no word. From our guest, I believe I, you know, let's see. I wasn't sure when I was, um, so hang on one second here. All right, and let's. All right, so we're just going to hang out here. And uh, so our uh, our good friend Adam has a uh, a sports uh, podcast with Chris Heidel, uh, sports talk with Chris Heidel, and he does it with uh, Chris and uh, one other gentleman, and uh, you can find that I believe that's also on Mondays. So, uh, cause I'm trying to, I'm, I'm supposed to be coming on, uh, but I have uh, some prior commitments with uh, this podcast and, uh, but yeah, it is, uh, check that out on YouTube. Uh, so let's see here.
Okay. All right. When I told him that he was not old and that he was only 45, he gave me the thumbs up. That's good. All right. Okay. Let's also take a look at. So let's. Uh, so like I, you know, like we stated, he won one point or earned one point seven million dollars during his twenty three years of uh, bowling on the PBA tour. Now that's public. You know what I mean? Like. But, of course, the money that, you know, hey, uh, how much did you make working for ESPN? You know, that's none of our business. And, uh, you know, so I hope nobody, you know, I hope nobody asks these pros that do extra stuff. Well, geez, how much did you make? How much do you, how much do they pay you to do this, that, and the other? You know, please don't ask those guys that question. It's, now, how much did you win when you won the U.S. Open? That's, that's, that's one thing because the U.S. Open, that is, uh, that is, uh, they, they show the prize money. Um, you know, during the telecast. So anyway, um, but anyway, he won $1.7 million during his playing days. And there's a uh, PBA bowler. And he was inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame in 1990 as... And he's also a member of the International Jewish Sport Oregon Sports uh, and uh, Medford Halls of Fame. There you go. That is awesome. Uh, so that is uh, that is great to uh, that is great to hear. And he bowled in fifteen USBC Open Championships and Masters, averaging more than two hundred. Um, his best finish in the USBC championship was fourth and uh, in the 1985 masters. Uh, so, I mean, he's, uh, he's done pretty well for himself. And of course he was in the booth uh, starting in, I want to say 1995 or six, I think it was 96. He was in the booth from 96 all the way into the year. Until the 2000, I want to say it was the winter tour ending in 2000 because, well, no, I'm sorry. It was the fall tour in 2000 that ended uh, because he was in the booth with Phil Ferguson from, I want to say, the fall of 98 until the end of the fall in 2000. And, of course, Randy Peterson made his debut, and we'll talk to Randy coming up on November 11, uh, made his debut in the booth in June, on June 17 of 2000. And But uh, after Marshall and Phil finished their stint in the fall tour of 2000, it was all Randy for the next 23-plus uh, years. So that's that's awesome stuff. Hang on just one moment. Looking for. Let's see. If you want a uh, <clears throat> another great podcast to listen to and watch. On YouTube and on Facebook, you should watch every single podcast. Uh, check out the Frankie uh, Fridays with Frankie, uh, Frankie and Ding Dong. Uh, I know those two personally, and uh, definitely like them on Facebook and follow their YouTube channel, uh, the Frankie and Ding Dong Show Fridays with Frankie. That is on um, 
YouTube, and yeah, they've had some pretty awesome guests. Now, uh, you can also follow Straight Up Five with Johnny Petraglia Jr., hosted by uh, Rad Rob at uh, Rad Rob Gaming, uh, Rob Francis, uh, the resident doctor, Dr. Ocho, and Johnny Petraglia Jr., of course, the namesake. Johnny Petraglia Jr. is not technically a junior, but, you know, just for the bowling world, he is uh, because, I mean, hey, don't take that away from that man. He's a great, uh, great guy. You know, his father is, of course, uh, Johnny Petraglia Sr. And, uh, you know, he just retired from bowling uh, this year. And he is definitely deserving of not having to deal with the stress of throwing a bowling ball. Now, does he bowl league and stuff like that? I actually do not know. But I do know that he is the manager of the Snickers Waco Wonder, which won the Elias Cup for 2023. What a great, um, <clears throat> what a great event that was and, and is, I should say. If you ever get a chance to go to Portland, Maine, or I should say come to Portland, Maine, because I live in Maine. I'm two hours north of Portland. All right. If you ever get that chance, please do come because it is something else. It really is. And it's one of the best things you could ever do for enjoyment. And one thing about it is I love, another reason why I love professional bowling is because you are, you are able to connect with the greatest bowlers in the world. You can't play basketball with LeBron James or Jason Tatum or anybody like that. You can't, you know, play pass on the ice with Sidney Crosby or Alexander Ovechkin. You can't even really contact them. I mean, I guess you can, but it just, it's just not like the sport of bowling where I have actually talked to the best bowler in the world of the 90s. Of course, I've met Walter Ray Williams Jr. And also, <clears throat> I have met... Uh, Jason Belmonte. So, yeah. I, and I do apologize for this delay. And when Marshall comes on, of course, we are not, I'm, you know, he's going to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know. Um, <clears throat> but he is, he is, uh, you know, he is, he is, whenever he comes on, he will be on time because, hey, you know what? This is not a serious podcast. Do I want to ask the hard questions? Yeah, you know what I kind of do. And, you know, at the same time, I am not uh, a heavy reporter. I mean, well, maybe I am. But no, I am not a heavy reporter where you need to, you, you know, you're required to talk to me and you you need to answer the questions that I ask you and uh, nothing's off limits, yada, yada, yada. No, 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 no. This is, this podcast exists because I love bowling and I want to talk about bowling. You know, nobody was having me on uh, their podcast. So I took it on myself eventually. I tried to do the All Things Bowling podcast, but I didn't really know uh, the way to go with that. But so that's why I started Flush in the Pocket podcast. Now, <clears throat> when I did start flush in the pocket podcast of course you had the initial episode with andrew pfeffer you know basically talking about the pba and previewing the pba 2023 season and you know that was all cool and all that all and that was that was a lot of fun and then episode two i was by myself going over the rochester open the 1992 rochester open and you know and i got some input from a guy that I respect a lot. And, you know, listen, I can do whatever I want on this podcast. I'm well aware of that. You know what I mean? But he made, he, he made a, a nice suggestion that, you know, listen, you want to want to get your stuff prepared and, you know, you want to cover stuff that is appealing to the pro to the bowling community. Uh, the 1992 Rochester open probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was probably a nice tournament to watch and uh, whatnot, but you know, 
so I took I took that and then I asked Parker Bone, of course he's a good friend of mine, to be on my podcast and he was last uh, last February. Yeah, this past February, I should say. And you know, that was a 1 hour and a half podcast and I said to myself, "You know what? That is the route that I need to take my podcast." Because if I do, that just seems because that was a great interview, right? And one thing that I will tell you, if you want to do a podcast, don't ever like I have nothing in front of me, but I can pull stuff up, right? Because I, you know, I'm right now. I'm currently talking to you uh, by myself, but when Marshall comes on, I'm going to ask him questions and and whatnot, and it's going to be a great it's going to be a great show. Um, <clears throat> so. When you want to do a podcast, what you need to do is you need to write everything down that you're going to, if you're going to have a guest, right? So if I had Marshall Holman as a guest, which, you know, and I didn't write down any questions, it would be a messy podcast. It really would because you don't. All right, Marshall, how'd you start bowling? Well, I started this way. Okay, who coached you? Okay. Um, all right, so how about, uh, you know what I mean? Like all the oohs and ahs and all that stuff, and you don't want to do that. So that is why the guest sees my question beforehand, and you write them down. You've got to write down your questions. And let's see where my questions for Marshall are. Oh, right there. Okay. So <clears throat> now we are coming up on, I believe, the two-year anniversary of the passing of Mark Roth. And I believe he died in November of 21, I want to say. And he was a great player and what was so great about him was he was the first cranker he was the you know the godfather or the grand the, the father of the power game if you will uh, nobody hooked a ball like mark roth but now you got excuse me now you guys now you got guys like jason belmonte uh oscu palerma um And yeah, uh, Adam, uh, definitely waiting for Marshall. I will see what is going on. Um, thank you very much for sticking with us here tonight. One, one second here. Is there a way to get a hold of him? I don't have his number. Um, must have been a busy day. Um, Let's see if I know someone who has his number. Um, who would have it? Not that I need it. But what made Mark Roth so great? It was he was uh, the first bowler that ever hooked the ball the way he did that we saw. And I mean, it was just, he was just a, a great champion bowler of the year, four times, 34 time titleist. And of course, Marshall Holman and him were, were doubles partners and uh, whatnot. So that is awesome. Uh, I am uh, of course a competitor because I am with Bolify, but there you go, Adam, that is excellent stuff. So. Uh, like I said, I do apologize for any delay. And let's see. Um, what are we going on? What's going on? I see. I wanted to come on live at 
at right on time because I didn't want to. Oh, he saw it. He saw it. He is on his way. Looks like he is on his way. And <clears throat> so there we go. Let's see. So, hold on one second here. Thank you, everybody, for waiting. We might have movement here. There we go. And of course, we're going to ask Marshall about his style. There's a lot of people looked up to Marshall, uh, and you know myself included, um, because of his his style and how he holds the ball so low. Uh, there, he wasn't alone. You know, I think Del Ballard said that he did it because of Marshall. And if I was to probably have Tony Westlake on the show, which is uh, that'd be nice. Uh, he would probably say, hey, Marshall inspired that out of me as well. So we'll see. And all right. So let's check out something here. And actually, I should wait just in case. Well, that's good, Adam. Uh, good luck in the upcoming season. And again, like I said, uh, this is uh, this is great. Marshall is uh, definitely a. fantastic guest and uh you know great opportunity to have this so hold on one moment here I'll check out straight up five with johnny petraglia jr because You want to, if you want to listen to them talk to uh, Ryan, the Ryan Express, Ryan Simonelli. Uh, that's going to, I have not checked that out yet, but I mean, they do a great job. So definitely check them out. And also, <clears throat> if you're new to this channel, please like and subscribe. Oh, hold on one moment here. All right, so I'm going to send him an email. And get him in here. Um, oh. Nope, I'm not going to send him his own email address. That would uh, be a little weird. All right, but uh, 
Hang on one second here, sir. Yes, sir, I will definitely do that. And what did I do? Um, yeah, that would be nice, Adam, if the uh, PBA came back to Carolier Lanes. That would uh, that would be excellent. All right. So there we go. Again, I appreciate everybody sticking bow. No, oh, no, don't do that to me. Address not found. Hold on. So it is. All right. Um, one minute here. Hold on. No. All right. Ah, God. Hold on, Marsh. Okay, it's not letting me send. Hold on one second, guys. Um, okay. um, uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I got it. Hold on one minute here. All right. Let's see what's up. You know what? I think if the if Carolier hosted Super Slam, that would be cool. Oh, there we go. There we go. We have we have liftoff, guys. Let's welcome to the studio. 22-time PBA champion, PBA Hall of Famer, uh, broadcaster for a number of years, Marshall Holman. Marshall, how are you, sir? I'm good. I, uh, you know, I got caught up watching the the uh, Phillies play in the Diamondbacks, and I'm also uh, watching the PJ Tour. There's a young man from Medford who's playing the Zozo, and uh, hey, <laughs> finally I. I'm glad I remembered in time. I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier. No, you are fine. Okay. This is your podcast, and 
uh, you know, I really appreciate you doing this and, um, no, nope, we're, we're all good. And I appreciate everybody for sticking around. So uh, let's, uh, so what's the, what's the score in the, in the baseball game and uh, what's going on with the guy in uh, Medford and the golf? I think the, I think the Phillies just hit a two run homer in the seventh and or eighth and they're up, I think they're up six, one. So uh, it looks like they're going to go up three, two. I don't, I don't know. I, I think, I think they go back to Philadelphia for the next game, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not covering, not carrying it that or really watching it that closely. As far right. as my buddy and uh, my my Dennis, the husband and wife Dennis, all right, the Woos, their son Dylan plays on the PGA Tour, and he didn't play he didn't play great the first couple of uh, first couple of rounds, but he's. Uh, He's one under through through eight holes today on his round and four for the tournament. So he is, uh, let's see, he's tied for 46. But uh, it's, you know, it's fun. It's fun to watch to watch somebody from Medford grew up right here. I've known him since he was just a little, little guy and uh, he's playing with the big boys. Yeah. Adam says hello. And uh, yeah, that's awesome. How, how's your golf game? You know, I'm glad you asked. I had my I had my uh, my birthday last last month on the 29th of September. Happy belated. And yesterday, for the first time in my life, I shot my age. I shot 69 yesterday at my home club, and uh, I had to scratch and claw for it. But it was uh, so. As of yesterday, my game was good. Now, who knows what tomorrow will bring? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're here talking to Marshall Holman, the bowler, and I think you'd rather do that. Um, how did you get started bowling? It was just something I saw on uh, on ABC television on a Saturday afternoon, and it, it caught my eye, and I asked my dad if he'd take me down to, uh, to our local bowling center, Medford Lanes, and uh, I bowled one game. Uh, shot I shot 71 not 171 mm -hmm. 71 mm -hmm. so I was certainly I was not a uh, I wasn't I wasn't good right off the bat but I something about it grabbed me and it was fun and I had a couple other friends that were starting bowling at the same time so we all used to ride our bikes down to the bowling center and uh, bowl Saturday morning uh, junior bowling and and then it, it became uh, I think at the age of 14, it became something that I, I really kind of was obsessed with. And uh, yeah, never, I, I can't remember ever missing a day between the ages of 14 and 17. Mm -hmm. and my game just took off. So when I, I, I actually had, I don't know how much you've seen of, of, the, of the podcast, but I actually had Del Ballard on here with Carolyn. And I asked Del how he came up with his style and he said he he idolized you how did you come up with the way you bowl you know down low the way you do and like how old were you when you discovered that and uh, when did that take off well there was a there was an older an older guy when i say older when i was when i was 12 or 13 years old he was 16, 70 years older than me, a guy by the name of Jerome Lee, who never never went on the bowling tour, but at one time he was the all-time leading money winner in uh, those high roller senior tournaments down in down in Las Vegas. Sure. He was a great player, and and that's the way he started out his his game, throwing the ball at a, from a little lower angle, and um, I subconsciously took that from Jerome Lee. Mm -hmm. Kind of so like you learn how to bowl the way that the way you learn how to talk, the way you learn how to walk, you know, by by your role models that are near you. So, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's how that came about. So I actually, so you kind of crouch over when you bowl, and I actually, when I met Parker in 2013, and he saw me bowl for the first time, he says, he says, "What's your, what's this? What do you? I mean, do you walk when you do you crouch when you walk?" I said, "No, well, stand up straight." <laughs> Do you recommend, um, you know, your style? Do you recommend people try it or? 
not necessarily. I mean, it certainly it worked well for me, and uh, I think it I think it sort of took it took one variable out of the game where you know I just I started out in a low position and I just stayed there throughout my approach. Um, I I was an instinctual player. I never I wasn't an X's and O's guy. I didn't take my game and break it apart and put it back together again. Mm-hmm. So I just did things instinctually. So, um, I mean, I would, I might take part of what, uh, I used to do and, and incorporate that into, into the game for, for people just starting, but I wouldn't necessarily try to, you know, to copy that completely. Sure. Who coached you? Oh, nobody really, you know, I, just, I, like I said, I, I bowled and I, I watched the other good players locally and, and then I started going to to tournaments in the Northwest and go up to, to Eugene and Portland and Seattle and and bowled against uh, you know some some very talented bowlers back in the day Johnny Gunther, Matt Serena, Earl Anthony, probably heard of that name. Oh yeah. He used to he bowled he bowled in a lot of tournaments in the Northwest when he wasn't on tour, and uh, that's where I really you know I think for any for any young young bowler that aspires to to, to take his game to the next level, get away from your hometown, find mm-hmm. yourself in the, in the deeper, in the deeper waters against, against some tough regional, um, competition and, uh, test yourself out amongst that. Well, I had to travel to Columbus, Ohio to get my first 600. So I kind of agree with you there. Uh, um, what did you accomplish in your bowling life that said, all right, it made you say, okay, I, I'm good enough to try the tour, and hey, you know, I may be successful. I don't know if I'm going to win 22 times, but what was the what was the thing that pushed you to get on the tour? Would you I, had a, I had a, a local businessman who offered me the the sponsorship money to try the tour. I never mm-hmm. really I never really thought that uh, that that was the direction I was going, and I just pulled because I enjoyed it, mm-hmm. uh, but I. I Went on the tour back in the summer of 1974, and I had some some early success. I made a couple of top five finishes in my first, I think, seven tournaments. And the one thing I did give myself was the opportunity that maybe maybe I will be a good player down the road. You know, I looked at I, I looked to my left, and I looked to my right, and I see these future Hall of Famers that are out there bowling and. Yep. And I just, I, I thought, well, they, they all started somewhere mm-hmm. and uh, someone's going to take their place. Maybe it'll be me. I, I wasn't, I wasn't cocky about it or sure about it, sure. but I figured, well, at least give myself, give myself a shot. Right. We got a comment here that uh, somebody remembers you at Gable House, which I love Gable House back in, uh, in the nineties when they would go and they closed, uh, they closed this year. Um, what made your ball roll so unique? Well, I think it was a combination of, uh, Hey Adam. Yeah. Good, good, good friend. Yeah, absolutely. Adam is a great guy. Yeah. It was a combination of, of power and accuracy that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had, I had a heavier role than, than the vast majority of the bowlers that I was up against. Um, Mm -hmm. And I could, and I could hit where I was looking. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, at that at that time, you know, in the in the in 1974, there were only a couple of people that could do that. Mark Roth and uh, and myself were really the the two that could that were able to take advantage of it. I mean, I, um, you know, looking back on it, it almost wasn't it almost wasn't a fair fight because. Uh, the things that the things that Mark could do with his ball, mm-hmm. and and that I could do at a little, a little lower, you know, trajectory. Um, it was it was fun. All, all we if we, if Mark and I could make it to the into the top twenty four, and then get into that match play, we knew on Friday that we were going to climb the ladder. It was just we just we knew it. And I think our opposition knew it as well. The lanes, 
lanes back then seemed to tighten up a little bit more and it was a little bit harder, you know, to, to get the 10 pin out. You know, there wasn't, you didn't do what you do in today. In today's game, if, if you're not getting the 10 out, you're not matched up right. Mm-hmm. No such thing as matching up in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, you took the you took the, the ball that you had, mm-hmm. and they were fairly close to the same, but just mm-hmm. a very rudimentary piece of equipment, and you made it work. Mm-hmm. In today's game, you not only have to make your equipment work, but if you better have the right piece of equipment in your hand or you're dead in the water. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I was watching, I think it was like a Miller Milestones. It was uh, uh, you talking about, you know, the big three of bowling, you, Mark, and Ant- and Earl. You called yourself the wacko that you, nobody knew what they were going to do. And I, I know I've said this to you before, but if – if, if you're a, you, for lack of a better term, you're the wacko that inspired a lot of people. Why would you refer to yourself as a wacko? Because I never knew what I was going to do either. You know, <laughs> there was nothing, there was nothing scripted about me. My, one of my, what got me involved in bowling, what got me interested in bowling, besides mm-hmm. watching the Saturday noon, t- afternoon telecast, was, it was watching bowlers like Carmen Salvino and Harry Smith. Yep. They were, just extraordinarily entertaining and I, I enjoyed that and they really captured my imagination and with, mm. with Carmen Carmen did a lot of things that were spontaneous but Carmen also did a lot of things that that were in his kind of scripted uh, way of, of emoting uh, so he Carmen kind of Carmen Carmen knew what knew what he was going to do mm-hmm. if, if he threw the big shot I never knew you know. I just it whatever whatever flopped out of my brains and my body is what you got. So yeah, that's why I was the wacko. No, oh, there you go. Well, what was your best moment on tour? Well, the first you know I was as I said, Carmen Salvino was such a a hero of mine, mm-hmm. and uh, my first two wins, he finished second. So beating Carmen in Fresno in 1975 mm-hmm. and a couple of months later in Hawaii, uh, climbing the step ladder and beating him there. That was, uh, those are two great moments. Certainly the, my first tournament of champions at, at, uh, at my first go round at, at, um, you know, in being an Akron at Riviera lanes, yep. that's, that's a highlight, but until you win the first tournament, you, you never know whether you could actually do it. And, uh, so uh, that was pretty special. That first, that first win was very special. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you were amazing to watch bold. Do you remember the year the roof leaks were there and you uh, curled off a pair before you got to, uh, hit by lightning? Did you get hit by lightning? Or- I don't recall being hit by lightning. <laughs> I do remember. I do remember bowling at uh, it was at uh, in Houston, okay, at Big Texan Lanes, and it was raining very, very hard. It was this big building with with, with with a flat roof, and there were buckets on numerous pairs. Fortunately, there were there were other pairs that we could that we could bowl on because there were so many lanes there. But uh, that was a 1981 U.S. Open. That was my first first U.S. Open that I won. So I. I don't remember any lightning, but I do remember bowling when it was raining inside the building. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, what would you say is your worst moment on tour? Oh, probably the uh, the foul line incident in, okay. uh, in Vegas. You know, I, I really looking back on it, I I got absolutely screwed. Um, Joe Antonora was was being pressured to. Uh, you know, to, to make an example out of me, the, I, you know, I caught it with the heel of my shoe. The, it was not screwed down very well. It, mm. it, you know, it wasn't where I hit it so hard that I, that I broke it loose from a solid foundation. And then he, he took, he suspended me for, for 10 weeks and $2,500. Mm. Very coincidentally, the 11th week was, uh, I think it was the great and the greatest. It was some kind of a, of an invitational tournament that I was eligible for. 
last place in the tournament, twenty five hundred dollars. Mm. So he knew he knew exactly what he was doing, and uh, you know, into in today's world, um, that same situation might receive a, a pat on the back from the commissioner instead of a a mm. boot ass. Mm, yeah, I got you. Um, what? Uh, let's see. Uh, did you have anyone num- anyone's number on TV in, or in match play? Uh, like you, I don't, you know, I don't. I don't really recall having anybody's number. I remember, I remember that um, whether I was leading the tournament or in twenty fourth place, if I bowled Dave Traber, he beat me. Okay. <laughs> but I, but as far as people who I had their number, uh, you know, when I was bowling good, I beat. I beat most of most of the people, but uh, you know I'm my my touring life really ended at about the age of thirty five, so mm-hmm. it's half a lifetime ago. No. Who did you? Who did? Uh, who who beat you up a lot on? Uh, was it Traber or did anybody else? Uh, but Traber, you like I said, Traber used to always 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 beat me. Uh, um, I had a bad television record. I think yeah. I had 115 or 20 telecasts, and I only won. I only won 22 tournaments. Mm-hmm. Uh, I led 21 events. I won seven of the tournaments I led. So I was I was uh, 33% there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really I. I'm not sure. You know, there were there were times when I had. Uh, yeah. When I was self-destructed, and there were other times where I got bad breaks, but you know, I it it was a it was a wonderful career. I had a I had a really good time. It was it was you know what I I miss I miss being good. You know, it was it was fun. It was fun to to go into any given center and know at the start of the tournament that that you had a really good chance to get to the to the end of the tournament. Yeah. You, when you were in the booth with Phil Ferguson, you mentioned you guys were at Highland Lanes, and you mentioned that there was a stretch where you uh, you lost, I don't know, 15, 18 in a row, and then you broke your streak there. Yeah, that was, I, broke that, I broke that streak in 1983. I, I went from, I think I went from 1981 till the summer of 83 without winning a game on TV. And I think it was, I think it was upwards of 20 some times. Mm-hmm. So, and that be and that that became became a little bit of a of a mental hurdle. Yeah. But yeah, that was so. I, and I enjoyed working with Phil. Phil's Phil's a good guy. I like. I oh like yeah. Him a lot. I haven't seen. I, I saw him a few years ago when I was in Akron, and uh, yeah, he's good people. You guys were very professional. I enjoyed your years with him. Hey. Uh, I I did because there was nothing, you know, not to. Not to step on anybody, but there was no catchphrases created. There was, uh, I mean, you you mentioned sealing the deal quite a bit. Um, you know, talking about a certain bowler trying to seal the deal. Um, but you, uh, I thought you guys were you and Gary and you and um, what was what was uh, how much fun did you have? Did you have more fun in the booth than you did on the lanes or? Well, I think it was it was more relaxing, uh, but no, I I I'd have to say I had more fun on the lanes. I mean, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing like, you know, like like being extraordinarily competitive on a week in week out basis. Uh, that being said, you know, once my once my playing career was over, mm-hmm. it's a pretty fun transition to go from from throwing balls badly late in my career to uh, to critiquing the best players in the world from the booth. I, I enjoyed that. That was, that was fun. And, uh, you know, I, my, I just tried to, I tried to, to, to watch the play and to explain the bad shots, explain the good shots, anticipate what, what they might've been thinking in, in certain situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's the show, the shows are different. Now the, the formats are different. The, um, you know, I think I think Randy, I think Randy does a does a credible job. I think he's, you know, he's been doing it for for a long time now. 
Mm -hmm. um, he he likes he likes the he likes that position. He likes to, and he, he does he throws a lot of a lot of stuff at you and he and he fashions himself as a as a bit of a of a comedian and he is and and he's and he's he's my friend. I've known Randy you know for for a, a long time. He tells a story about the first time that he ever bowled me in match play was at the showboat and yeah. we're bowling each other and and I get up and I'm 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 leading and I leave a I leave a pocket seven ten mm -hmm. and I proceed to make it and it and I just turned around and I sort of growled at him and I think it scared him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, I texted Ozio and told him that you're going to be on tonight. And he says, oh, yeah, Marshall's one of the greats and whatnot. And uh, I met him in 93 and asked him who his favorite bowler was. And he said it was you. So he used, you know, when he first came out on tour, he spent a lot of time watching me bowl. And, you know, you talk about, you know, I said earlier how I was a very instinctual player. Ozio, the t polar opposite. He would take everything and break it all down, and he would analyze and and he he took aspects of my game and put them into his game, and and he was a, a wonderful shot maker and a beautiful player. And I was actually thinking about Dave in the last couple of days. I've got a telephone number for him. I don't know if it'll if it still gets to him, but uh, I need to give him a call. He's a he's a he's yep. a good man. Absolutely, absolutely great man. Um, what was uh, what was your favorite uh, bowling ball era? Well, I liked, uh, you know, I liked it back when, when we were using yellow dots. <laughs> yeah. So that was a ball that I could, that I could read very, very easily. Um, and then as we transitioned into rudimentary, um, urethane, you know, with like, uh, I was with Columbia, so I threw the black U dot and, and the wine U dot. Mm -hmm. I, I liked, I liked them. My, my game, my game took a, took a big dip south when the reactive resin came out because okay. I never, I didn't adjust with it. And, you know, I could always make the ball work. And so I figured, well, I can make this work and I couldn't because instead of seeing the lane from the front to the back, you had to see the lane from the back to the front. And it was all about getting the ball to the break, to a break point. And it was like going from English to Japanese for me. Yep. Was you, you had it come together though in '96 at the Ebonite Classic? You were the number one seed. What kind of? I know that they were just they just started the resin era, but um, what what was your week like that week? It was a throwback week. The, the okay. lanes reacted. The lanes reacted like they did back ten ten years prior, uh, okay. and uh, you know I I ended up bowling. Wayne Webb for the for the title. So we were two guys from back in the day that uh, that had that had a hot week. Wayne was Wayne had continued to bowl good uh, when reactives came out because he made the right kind of adjustments. But that was a that was a screwy week. You know, I had just started working for ESPN. Uh, one of the things that I told the hierarchy at ESPN would before I got the job, I said, not only do I think I can do the best job for you, but you don't have to worry about me making any telecasts. My game washed up. I'm done. So don't worry about don't worry about that ever happening. The second week that I was working for them was was the ninety six uh Ebonite Classic that I won. And then I I, I remember proclaiming <clears throat> when I threw the winning spare and I said, I'm back and and I know I wasn't. I went back. I happened to win that tournament, but but I wasn't. That was it. That was it. Yeah. Um, so Adam wants to know um, if you wanted, if would you bowl a PBA fifty tour stop? You know, I I bowled one PBA fifty tour stop. It was probably when I was fifty or fifty one. Uh, and I hadn't, uh, I hadn't bowled, I hadn't, I hadn't been bowling in like ten years. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't competitive, and so I decided that uh, I, di I didn't want to do that. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put myself up against guys who I used to beat 
pretty handily. Mm-hmm. Let them just wipe the floor with me, and they and they would have because the guys that kept they kept going, and those and those guys that that were business people that that decided at fifty they wanted to try it. They were better than me at that point, and I wasn't gonna. I wasn't, I wasn't going to give anybody the satisfaction to be able to just clean my clock. I did see another question. Somebody asked me what Mike Durbin was like. Yeah, Adam wanted to know what uh, I, I, I apparently I don't know how to use StreamYard, but uh, what uh, we wanted to know what Mike Durbin was like. Well, I was really fortunate to work with Mike in television, and uh, when Mike and I were were bowling competitively, we we didn't get along very well. And really? I'm sure, I'm sure that 90% of that was was me being an idiot. But uh, but Mike and I, Mike and I did not get along. And then we started working on tele- in television together. And really, I I count him as a as a good friend. And I really, I treasured those years working with him. You know, for to to be in the to be in the color commentary seat, you're basically just there. You know, BS and about what you know. Right. But doing uh, doing the play by play. That's a much more technical seat. And Mike Mike did a really nice job. I thought Mike did a great job. He's a very he's a very intelligent man. He was a he was a great bowler. And uh, yeah, I, I got to I got to see a different side of Mike doing television with him, and he also got to see a different side of me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it was it was great i enjoyed it a lot is he still around i believe so okay i believe, I believe he and debbie you know i played i play words with friends with debbie sure and, okay and she kicks my backside she's 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 too smart <laughs> but yeah uh yeah mike mike's still around I, and i i see his uh i see his son post stuff on facebook and uh yeah 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 there you go. so um <clears throat> kind of <clears throat> kind of going backwards a little bit uh the he says that uh the 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 <clears throat> the uh lightning incident or whatever the raining incident was at gable house and at least because it was actually uh rained in la and whatnot um he wants to know if you got any rain on your head or whatever. Well, but back then, I probably had some hair to keep the rain from hitting my, <laughs> my scalp. Yeah, there you go. Um, what? Um, so, <clears throat> question number nine was: Did resin hurt you? Um, and who yes. do you think? Who else do you think it hurt? And why do you think it hurt you? It hurt me because of, because the the way you read the lanes changed, and I was too pig headed to change with it. Okay. So, yeah, it definitely it definitely hurt me, and mm-hmm. and it also it, it helped it helped uh, it helped a lot of bowlers out with, that had less hand mm-hmm. as the resins were were stronger and it was like it was like built in power was right was in the ball it was no longer it was no longer just about what the what the player could do with the ball but it was about what the about what the ball could do to the pins so uh, it it helped. It helped a lot of players, and uh, and it hurt some players. But you know, you can only you can only you know do what you can do during your career. I was fortunate to have you know probably fifteen pretty darn pretty good years from the from the start of my of my bowling on tour, and then when residents came out, it it was uh, it was a struggle. Yeah. Um, and so the golf game, we talked about that earlier. If you want to check it out, uh, watch this on, on replay. Um, when you were in the booth, you did night telecast, you did weekend telecast. What did you prefer? Well, I liked, I liked being on the, I, I, I've never really liked traveling that much. So I liked being on the West coast. However, mm-hmm. West coast telecasts were tough. Because you had, because if we were, especially if we were like bowling in the afternoon, mm-hmm. we had to be there at an ungodly hour in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, I I enjoyed all the telecasts. It was they were they were fun. I I had a, I had a good time with them. I 
I try to, um, you know, to do them as professionally as possible. My father was a broadcaster, so he would he would watch every one of my telecasts that I was doing the the commentary with a with a with a pad and a pencil, and he would write he would write down things I did good, things I could do better, and uh, so it was uh, it was also a good a good bonding time for me and my dad. Who, he passed away in uh, in the summer of 2001, and I think I did my last telecast in the winter of 2001. Yeah, all right. So, but yeah, it was it was it was a, it was a real cool thing for me and my dad, mm-hmm. and uh, and I I loved it. Yeah, I'm very I'm very sorry for your loss, by the way. Um, when you okay, so what was your favorite moment as we talked about your best moment on tour. What was your best moment on the in the broadcast booth? Oh gosh, God, I, I can't. I really can't think of any one particular moment. I know it was. I uh, let's see. Uh, Mike Miller had a three hundred game. Yep, and that that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, gosh, my. There were a couple. There were a couple three hundred games that I called that that were that were a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's there were many many clutch moments. You know, I was I wasn't always the most clutch player. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to win, which is, you know, you look at my twenty two victories and thirty one or two second place finishes. That mm-hmm. that says a lot. But uh, well, I I really I really appreciated people stepping up and getting it done when the heat was on. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have a, like a, a uncomfortable moment or like uh, wor- what was maybe the worst moment as a broadcaster or anything like that? Well, it was always uncomfortable just before a show started. Okay. To walk around practicing my opening and mm-hmm. I would be, I'd be talking to myself mm-hmm. and pacing and I was always uncomfortable uh, just prior to the shows, and uh, especially on live shows. But that's also where I did my best work, because mm-hmm. you know when when you're doing live television and it's three, two, one, go, yep. and the metaphorical gun is to your head, and you've got to and you've got to step it up. Yep. Somehow you do. It's I, I always felt like it was it was easier doing a live show than a tape show because on a tape show. You could screw something up, then you could do it over again. Right. If you never um, have to do it over again, usually you, you pull it off. Right. Uh, I was watching a little bit before, uh, about an hour ago. I watched the New York City experience when you guys, they were bowling outside. Mm-hmm. How cool was that? And where was the booth for you guys? Well, that was that was uh, done in Bryant Park. Yeah. And uh, and the booth was not not far from where the, where the lanes were. And it was a it was a kick, and we I, I it was fantastic. We had a great time. Uh, I think I think Eric Forkel won that tournament. Yep, beat Mark Mosabi. Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, we had we had a good time. That was uh, that was fun. You know, we were sort of at the mercy of the of the gods as far as the weather was concerned. And I think they they built a little bit of a of a of a overhang. In case in case the weather got bad, but but we had it was a nice day, and we had, we had a we had a good show, and you know it was it was fun doing something different like that. Awesome. So uh, when you were on tour, what was your favorite tour stop? Anywhere where I could play golf four or five <laughs> times a week. So I I suppose my one of my favorite tournaments was the eighty five U S Open at. Uh, Galaxy Lanes in, in Venice, Florida. Mm-hmm. I was staying. I was staying uh, in a condo at a golf course, and I got there a little early and played golf on Saturday and Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then we bowled three eight game blocks Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So if I was bowling late one day, I would play golf early. If mm-hmm. I was bowling early, I'd play late, and then and I and I. Play golf with some friends uh, the morning of the telecast, so wow. so that was that was a lot of fun. But I mean, they used to people used to ask me, "What's your 
where's your favorite place to bowl? And, and back when I was doing my good work, I like bowling everywhere. I, I bowled pretty good everywhere. And then yeah. later in my career, I bowled good nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was, uh, what was your least favorite tour stop? I never bowled well in Baltimore. Okay. Not really sure why. I think, well, it had to, it had to do with the way the, the way the, the lanes played. They, they didn't play as well for for me because I like to throw the ball from the from the left to the right and bring it back, and that was more of a straighter trajectory um, in in uh, in that Fairline Center. But yeah, I, had, I mean, I liked I liked the area, mm -hmm. but I didn't I didn't bowl well there. Um, if you were bowling at Bayside when you were in your yeah. heyday. And the crowd was the way it is right now. Would that help you? Hurt you? I would love it. Yeah, love it. You know, we we used to bowl at, at Red Carpet Lanes in Milwaukee, and yeah, that was that was a bowling center that had <clears throat> lanes on this side and lanes on this side, and in between there was a bar, mm -hmm. and then there was there was also there were also bars on both sides of the lanes, and uh, the crowds they would. They'd have a, they would have a few beverages and they would and they would get on my on my case a little bit but but I enjoyed it I I liked it and I I love I love Bayside Bowl I I think what uh, you know what Charlie has done with that with that bowling center and uh, the way that those fans step up and and get behind it and just absolutely love it it's um, it's fantastic I would have I would have loved to have bowled would have loved to have been you know, at my height, bowling in that atmosphere, that would have, that would have been a lot of fun. I know the, I can, I've never, I've never talked to a, to a player today that doesn't absolutely love it there. And you're the manager of the Milwaukee? Milwaukee Pounders. Yeah. The, the Paps Blue Ribbon Milwaukee Pounders probably, probably made the biggest bonehead decision of any manager in the history of of the of the PBA league, um, me and my brain trust, which are basically um, Sean Rash and Dick Allen, mm -hmm. decided that it would be might not be a bad idea to uh, to get rid of Brian Simonelli and and, uh, mm -hmm. and draft someone else. Mm -hmm. And Ryan hadn't been hadn't been bowling great. But Ryan was the MVP of the tournament. His team won. Mm -hmm. He did it stepping on us on the way to victory. So mm -hmm. Congratulations to Ryan. Ryan, yeah. and, Ryan and I are we're, we're, we're good friends. <clears throat> good friends. Yeah. And, and I congratulated him, but yeah, not uh, not keeping him came back to bite us. Yeah, but how? I mean, how would you have known? You know what I mean? I get. I guess you know, I get where making educated guesses. Right. Um, I mean, absolutely. And Ryan, Ryan is a great guy. We're on the same shirt staff. He's yeah. hell of a man. Um, <clears throat> what, um, where did the PBA never go when you were on tour that you wish they had? Well, they never went to Medford, Oregon and they, they started coming here, you know, shortly after I retired. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it would have been nice. It would have been nice to bowl in front of the hometown people, you know, back when I was was doing well. Right. Um, but yeah, I I enjoyed I enjoyed that that vagabond lifestyle for ten or fifteen years when I was, you know, from the ages of nineteen to thirty four, thirty five. I was I was out on tour pretty regular, and and uh, I I. I can't imagine traveling like that now. You know, I just, uh, yeah. I like, I like staying, I like staying home. I don't mind, you know, once, once or twice a year, I'll go out for the, for the PBA league and I'll go to the, uh, to the telecast of the, the Roth Holman doubles. And, uh, that's pretty much the extent of, of what I do for bowling now. Yeah. Does it? This is a kind of a bonehead question that probably only I would ask. Does it bother you that you can't swim at uh, Crater Lake, and why can't you? No, it does not bother me. And I was just there. 
I was there just oh a few months ago when the uh, when Sam Villarreal. Sam is is the guy that does all the caricatures that you see of, of bowling. Mm -hmm. um, Sam's been coming out to the to the member guests at my club for for a number of years, and and uh, we took him to to Crater Lake, and and it's a it's quite a schlep from from the viewing area of Crater Lake to actually get down to the water, and yeah. and I believe I believe that the uh, the constant temperature of that lake you don't want to swim in it. Yeah, yeah. It is, but it is gorgeous. Yeah, are, you're. Are you even? You're not even allowed to. I don't believe so. Okay. But I, I've never. Never tried. No, I've never. I've never wanted to swim a career lake. It's. It's fun. It's. It's fun to see it. I've been there. I've been there in the summertime when it when it's beautiful, and I've been there in the in the winter time when they have a lot of snow, and I've snowshoed there, and it's a, it's an amazing spot. Yeah. In Southern Oregon, you have to go to Crater Lake. There you go. Um, so what was a PBA rule that you agree with? PBA rule that, that I agree with? Yeah. Uh, well, don't cheat. Okay. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Well, no, that's funny. Cause when I, the way that this podcast, uh, went and I, after I interviewed Parker, I was like, that's what I got to do. I got to interview anybody. That will, and when I first, he was the first PBA pro that I interviewed. So I was like, I always put that on every, every podcast because I want to see, you know, it's, I want to see what people say. But, um, is there a rule that you didn't agree with? Well, they used to have, they used to have rules on, on what you could wear and, and, and the length of your hair and stuff. And I, yep. and that was, I thought that was a little bit, ridiculous yeah. but um you know it was it was a different it was a different time mm -hmm. yeah what was not a pba rule that should have been uh boy a rule that wasn't should have been well i i i don't know i i probably that that i should have won more <laughs> there you go there you go. Um, so, and I wanted to know because uh, how is everything at um, at Lava Lanes? How is Rick and his staff doing? How's the place doing? Rick has not been associated with Lava Lanes in many years. Really? Yeah. He he and it's and it's from yeah for quite a long time. And right. uh, from what I've I've been able to glean over the years, it's been a good thing for Rick because when Rick was was the, the proprietor at the, at the bowling center. He was, he was there a lot. Yeah. He's, he's been able to spend a lot more time with his, with his family since he's, since he has not been the, the, uh, the man running that bowling center. Yeah. Uh, so, but the Lava Lanes is, Lava Lanes is now owned by, by uh, a guy by the name of Brett Breeze, who I've known for, for many years. He's not a, he's not a bowling guy. He's, mm -hmm. He's a businessman, and uh, I guess they're doing okay. I, you know, I don't, I don't go there, I don't go there very often, so I'm not, I'm not, okay. not really sure. All right. So uh, that's the regular questions. And when I, uh, you know, started this podcast, and I said, all right, let's do, let's go instead of 12, uh, 10 questions, let's do twelve questions. Just random, fun questions. We're gonna go flush in the pocket. When was the last time you bowled three hundred? A long time ago. Well, you're going to bowl one right now, and you don't even have to – no stress involved at all. A long, um, long time ago. Oh, there you go. What's your favorite food? I got a great recipe for spaghetti and meatballs that I that I got from a, from a, from a girlfriend that I was with from 1980 to 1990 mm -hmm. from New England, and it's from a friend of hers from, from Boston. Okay. So, I mean, it takes a long time to put it all together, but it's it's just amazing. If you were on Master Chef, could you do it in forty five minutes? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I couldn't. I'm terrible. I'm terrible to do anything quick. My 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 girlfriend uh, Tina, unfortunately, a couple weeks ago, she broke she broke her right foot. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, and she's 
she has to get a CAT scan to find out whether they have to do anything or not. But in the meantime, she was she was using my my mom moved in with us last year, so she was using my mother's walker. My mom will be ninety two in a couple of weeks, so wow. she's using her walker to try and get around. And so I I ordered a uh, one of those little scooters that that you know for people that have a bad leg mm -hmm. and. Words that I hate more than anything are some assembly required. <laughs> yep. It took me, I got the damn thing put together today, but I'm thinking it took four times longer than it should have. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very handy around the house. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, what is your, uh, happy early 29th birthday to your mother, by the way, that's, yeah, well, we're to, my sister is coming down from from up north with a bunch of family. She's renting a renting a big house, and we're gonna have. Mom likes to party. So hey, we're gonna have. We're gonna not that she's she's not gonna be having multiple cocktails and smoking pot, but right. she, she she likes having the family around, and so we'll we're gonna have a good time. She's actually she's out right now with a with a, a friend of hers at a at a play at. Uh, in Ashland, where they have Ashland's sort of famous for it's one of the one of the few places in the country that has has an Elizabethan theater. So the yeah. festival here, but she's at she's at some play tonight, and um, you know for for being less than two weeks away from ninety two, she's doing pretty good. There you go. What's your favorite music, Marshall? Huh? Favorite music? Favorite music? You know, I. I like I, I like listening to uh, to songs from back in my days. I like I like the Beatles. I like classic rock and roll. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not up on on any of the new artists. I know when I was a kid, my parents looked at me sideways at the stuff I listened to, and 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 now you know I I'm not I'm not much I'm not a hip hop guy. Or, right. That, that stuff is just it's it's not for me but I, it's not that it it's not that it doesn't have merit it just doesn't sure. have merit for me my parents look at me sideways and i just listen to country i mean they, you know listen. yeah i like some of that as well oh, there you go uh adam is a adam is a aerosmith fan but um what was what was your favorite sports moment as a fan Well, I think it was in 2010, 12, and 14 that the that the San Francisco Giants won the World Series. Oh, okay. So I was pretty pretty pumped up for, for, for them. Um, I also I'm a big baseball fan. I was I, I was very very happy to see. I think it was in 2004 when the Red Sox finally broke the the, the curse of the Bambino. So I thought that was I thought that was great. Um, yeah. And uh, some of the you know, some of the great boxing matches back in the day, you know, with with uh, with Muhammad Ali and and Frazier and George Foreman, those were those were great sporting moments. Um, what is your least favorite sports moment as a fan? Well, that would be if my San Francisco Giants had a chance to win and didn't. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Hang on. So, uh, what um, best advice ever given? Ah, gentleman by the name of Junior Powell, who was uh, living in Florida, originally from the Toledo area. He was uh, one of one of Don Carter's partners back in the day in all of his bowling centers, and a very successful businessman. And Junior told me that it's easy. He said, making money is easy. Try holding on to it. That's the tough thing. Right. So that, that was, that was great advice that, that helped me to be a little more fiscally responsible to myself at a younger age so that I could still have something today. Yeah. Uh, we got to 
somebody's favorite sports moment it was your worst uh when the uh, angels won the world series back in uh, 2002 uh but uh let's see here um what would what would you say would be the smartest thing you ever did smartest thing i ever did yeah i quit gambling in vegas okay and the year i quit gambling I won, I think, twelve or thirteen hundred dollars on a on a two dollar and ten cent kino ticket, mm-hmm. and that was the year that I that I quit. Cause I used to, I was terrible, the terrible gambler. I would I'd go to Vegas and I'd be there for a week, and this is going back into the in the late you know the nineteen seventy seven eight nine in the early eighties, and I would lose like a thousand dollars, which is mm-hmm. a lot of money. Yeah, oh, yeah, and. Um, I finally just, it took me a while to figure it out that, that I wasn't good at that. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, it didn't, it didn't affect my bowling there, but mm-hmm. it, yeah, I just, yeah, that was the best thing I ever did. Dumbest thing you ever did. Uh, well, I guess it was all, all those years before I quit. <laughs> I, I can remember, I can remember I could. I it was like I couldn't go to. If I had money in my pocket, I couldn't go to bed. I had. I had to spend all my money, and then yeah. I. And then okay, I'll go to sleep now. And so I would lose like. I would lose like two hundred one day, three hundred one one day, yeah, yeah. and I would. I would always end up going to bed broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you, if you were not a pro bowler, and you didn't have the amazing career that you had, what would you have done for a living? That is a mystery. Um, I don't know. I'd like to think that I would have gone back to school and done something with my life, but I don't know. I I, I really don't know. I was very was very fortunate that I never had to had to find out. Uh, I was not I was not an overachiever in school. I did not like school. Sure. I don't think I was. I don't, I don't think it was a lack of intelligence is more we just a, I, I just didn't I, I didn't like it I didn't want to I didn't have a good work ethic back in the day so God who who knows it might have been I'm sure it wouldn't be I'm sure it wouldn't be as good as it is now okay um so do you have any phobias Well, I guess I've got some, some, I, some superstitions. I, I, I find myself uh, if something works, I continue to do that, and and so, but I'm I'm a little superstitious as to like I know when I when I when I bowl on tour, I would always take the towel and wipe the bowl off the same amount of times every time and try. Mm-hmm. Keep, try and keep that that uh, the rhythm of uh, of staying staying in <clears throat> in whatever it took to keep me comfortable. But um, uh, I guess that's that's about that. All right. If you were dying of thirst and you just you know you need something to drink, what's your go to beverage? Oh, I like I like a nice uh, I like a nice mildly hoppy IPA. Oh, there you go. Okay. I tell people I, I like a nice, I like a beer with a little bit of bitterness to it to mm-hmm. match my personality. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, next time you come to Portland, I'll get you one. Um, and last question, when you leave this earth, how do you want to best be remembered? Oh, so I just a uh, somebody with, with, with a, more than average amount of passion. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Uh, you know what, Marshall? Thank you so much for doing this. I hope my questions weren't too uh, intrusive. Um, oh, great. You know, I really appreciate your time. You're a great guy. And uh, Monday, I got Tom Smallwood. I'm sure you have a few. Uh, I'm sure you know who. He's a great guy. So. Yeah. So tune in Monday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. And uh, Marshall, it's been fun. And uh, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you later. Okay, Derek. Thank you, sir.
All right, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. That was the great Marshall Holman. And uh, like I said, I apologize for the delay, but uh, we got here, we did it, and we had a great time. And thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Tune in Monday, two days, or I guess maybe a day now, well, whatever. Uh, from now, Monday at 8 p.m., you got you got Tom Smallwood, three-time PBA champion, two majors, including the 2009 PBA World Championship. I'm going to create that episode tomorrow and be a great episode uh, to talk to him on Monday. So uh, we'll talk to you later and you have a good night. This has been flush in the pocket presented by Brunswick and sponsored by just in time recreation. Check out just in time recreation at just in time bowl.com. Check out their birthday parties and, uh, Give them a call at 207-786-2695. All right, everybody. Have a good one, and I will talk to you later.